to make a special note of two really good things that came out of WWE Battleground. Number one, the effort of the performers was outstanding. I appreciate and respect when I see performers that are supposed to be trying to entertain me actually looking like they give a shit. Like they actually care about what they're doing and they care about trying to entertain me. I appreciate that and I respect that. And pretty much everybody that I saw on the show last night uh, seemed to be concerned with doing just that. So hats off. Mad respect. I also appreciate and respect that St. Louis crowd that was into it throughout the night, not just trying to sit there and hijack everything and take it over and say, oh, look at how awesome we are. No, they were a part of the show, but they did it in a good way. They were consistently engaged. They were helping to make the show uh, somewhat entertaining. You know, So that effort from that audience was appreciated as well. Now, I can ultimately imagine that this show is going to create a very split reaction. You're going to have those that really, really like what happened. And you're going to have those that really, really don't. And I can understand it from both perspectives. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of debate in the comments section uh, geared towards me and geared towards others about what actually happened on the show and whether it was good or not. But here's my thing. While the effort was great all throughout the night and the audience was really good and those things will certainly help the viewing experience, it can't fix everything. At the end of the day, the WWE had five weeks, five weeks, five weeks, five weeks, oh no, five weeks to build up to this thing. They had over a month to make this something good. They had over a month to prepare for this. And you basically, yes, with the IC triple threat being shelved, what have you, you only ended up with five announced matches on this card. For a three-hour show, that is completely and totally inexcusable. It's not a two-week turnaround here. You had five weeks, and that was the best they could do. But what did Battleground ultimately end up being? It really was more of the same from the WWE. Frankly, a waste of time, and here's what I mean. It's the same old shit. You know, spot-filled spot matches that don't really tell a story, that really don't have a lot of purpose that people are going to overrate, then numerous things that feel like pointless filler crap that end up being a complete waste of time, including certain things involving Cena that always seem to be a waste of time, all culminating with a main event that gives you some type of bullshit finish, yet at the same point in time gives you that moment, gives you that item, gives you that hook that suckers you in, keeps you wanting more, and helps the WWE survive till the next month, and helps mask over everything else that was crap that happened throughout the rest of the night. That's what Battleground did. And that's what WWE does with their pay-per-views now. I'm tired of this shit. You had five weeks to prepare for this. You could have certainly done a whole hell of a lot better than you did. I mean, for crying out loud, if you're kicking off a pay-per-view with Sheamus versus Randy Orton, you're automatically starting out at a major deficit. You're not in a good place. Sorry, gold standards. Stick it up your arse. Sheamus versus Randy Orton on any pay-per-view is not must-see WWE Network special event shit. And you would think at least, with all of the times they faced each other, that practice would make perfect. But of course, it doesn't. Now, while certainly many are going to sit there and talk about how this was good and how they got into it as it went along, I throw the bullshit flag on that. This shit fucking sucked. This is part of the problem, again, when you only have five announced matches for a three-hour show, knowing you're good, and of course you're not even going to run close to the three hours like you did on this night, then you throw in one filler match, so you give us six matches and a freaking segment, a couple of backstage interviews, and that's the three hours, meaning that these matches all have to go longer than they need to. That's the problem with doing six matches on a three-hour show. These matches go too long. Not every match needs to go 12, 15, 18, 20 minutes. It makes everything kind of feel the same. Nothing really stands out. And for my money, if you were just going to have Randy Orton win in his hometown, and at least they freaking did that, then why waste everybody's time? You want this to stand out? You want to really kick off the show in a big way? You started off, bell rings, Sheamus goes for a bro kick, he misses, Randy Orton falls down and comes up, RKO out of nowhere, one, two, three, it's fucking over. 
Instead of the heel having to go through all this bullshit just to lose to Randy Orton, it's better off for the heel to lose almost immediately because he could throw the bullshit flag. He could sit there and say he didn't really beat him. Well, he's lucky. It was a fluke. And all the while, you sit there and say you got the result that you fucking wanted. The WWE saved you a bunch of time and energy from having to watch this shit that you've seen so many other times that you'd actually be happy with Sheamus versus Randy Orton. I did enjoy the tag title match quite a bit. Gee, imagine that. But clearly, based off of the reactions of the crowd, I wasn't the only one that enjoyed this. Hey, WWE, guess what? The fans do like the black guys. It's okay to push them. They can be stars, too. Especially if you're pushing athletes. You affect the credibility of your product if you don't have numerous black athletes at the top of your freaking sport. The fans were into New Day. They were into the primetime players. And no Vince and Kevin Dunn and Michael P.S. Hayes. It's not just the black people. The white people like them too. So imagine that. You give the black guys a chance. You give them a platform to do something. You put a little effort behind them. And they can do something. Jeez, freaking imagine that. But instead what happens is these guys get saddled with situations where they end up having to get over in spite of the WWE not with the help of or because of the WWE. Hats off to these guys for making the most of their times. Hats off for these guys making it work. And fuck you, WWE, for thinking that this type of shit wouldn't work. Imagine if you only gave these guys more of a platform and more energy and effort, what you could do with them. The Seth Rollins character is one of a pussy, cookie-cutter, chicken-shit heel. So it's not surprising when he does pussy, cookie-cutter, chicken-shit things. You expect him to do pussy, cookie-cutter, chicken-shit things, and are not surprised when he does said pussy, cookie-cutter, chicken-shit things. In fact, you expect it. Now, you might not always like that they do it with him. You might not always think it's the right idea. But when they do do it, you sit there and can at least buy it. You say, based off of what they do with the character and who he is and what he is about, if he has to get help, if he runs off, if he intentionally gets himself counted out or DQ'd, that makes sense. I get where they're going with the character, whether I agree with it, like it or not. I understand it, and I can buy into this. So it makes sense. For some reason now, the Bray Wyatt character to me absolutely makes zero fucking sense, especially when it comes to his matches. He's supposed to be that cerebral mind fuck mind games type of guy. That guy that's supposed to be able to get under your skin and do all of this crap. And all the while, most of his tactics are cowardly, pussy, cookie cutter, chicken shit things. From doing his pre-recorded vignettes when he's not there, to having other people coming out to fight his battles, to having to sit there and turn out the lights to come on to attack somebody, attacking somebody from behind, to the way he works in the ring. Bray Wyatt's supposed to be this mind games type of guy, and so much of his matches, you can't fucking tell. That's why when I saw a trademark last night, tweeted about he could count the number of really good matches Bray Wyatt's had on one hand. I'm like, yeah, he's probably right. I can only really think of two really, really good ones that I really, really like. They were both in 2014. One was against Daniel Bryan at the Royal Rumble, and it was Shield versus the Wyatt Family Elimination Chamber. That's it. A lot of these other matches are passable or below passable, and that doesn't necessarily make them good. And part of the problem is, is that Bray Wyatt's character does shit in a match that absolutely makes no fucking sense for the character. He's the type of guy, with them being the type of guy that he is supposed to be, the way he is presented, he should be encouraging Roman Reigns to hit him repeatedly. He should be hitting himself on the freaking head. He should be pulling Roman Reigns over him for the cover to fuck with him and then kick out of it. Doing all this shit that he doesn't do anything the fucking of. Bray Wyatt just works like a cookie cutter chicken shit eel. And all the while, the only way he can win a fucking match is to do pussy cookie cutter cowardly chicken shit heel things by having to have somebody come out and run interference so that way he can fucking win a match or stand tall or whatever the case might be. It makes sense when it's Seth Rollins because of who Seth Rollins' character has been portrayed as and has developed as. That makes absolutely no fucking sense with Bray Wyatt. At least when Roman Reigns comes out, you say his character makes so much more sense whether you like it or not. 
He's a big ass kicker. He talks like a big ass kicker. He walks like a big ass kicker. And then when he comes out, guess what? He wrestles like a big ass kicker. It makes fucking sense. Frankly, if I'm looking at it from a standpoint of the character matching what the performer does in the ring and these things having harmony and making sense, Roman Reigns' character makes a whole lot more fucking sense than a Bray Wyatt's does. And personally, as a result, I think the Roman Reigns' character, frankly, should be a lot easier for you to get behind and root for than fucking Bray Wyatt's does. But in general, this match was just another kind of semi-snooze fest involving Bray Wyatt. It was so bad that, yeah, it became a snooze fest because I fucking fell asleep. And now what? We're going to position him to maybe face off with Sting in some type of one-on-one -on -one or tag match at SummerSlam? So that way we're going to put a Bray Wyatt in a situation where he's going to act again like a cowardly chicken shit heel going against the ultimate in mind games guys in the Sting type of character. All the while, Bray Wyatt can't afford to lose the freaking match because God knows he needs as much momentum as he can get. All the while, Sting, who should have won at WrestleMania 31, most certainly shouldn't be coming to work another match just so that way he can lose fucking again. So it's one of those deals, yet again, similar to Bray Wyatt versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania. It was a lose-lose situation for all parties involved. And while the WWE desperately badly needs Sting at SummerSlam in the worst way, they don't need him to face off with Bray Wyatt where one of these guys ultimately has to fucking lose. I mean, come on, let's, let's be honest here. This Divas triple threat, it's a stupid setup. And frankly, the match itself doesn't really have a whole lot of purpose in the grand scheme of things. And most certainly makes absolutely no fucking sense. I don't give a fuck if you're getting mini chubbers because Ric Flair with a pussy and Sasha Banks and freaky Becky Lynch are on the main roster. whoop de doo The whole fact of the matter is these girls were supposed to be back up to Paige. That's what she was looking for. And now it's become this three-on-three-on-three -on -three -on -three kind of faction war in the Divas division. And all the while, the storytelling and the writing for this is completely and fucking totally idiotic. So it fits perfectly into the mold of what the WWE does with their Divas division. And then again, the whole portrayal of Stephanie all of a sudden being this great fucking bastion of equality and uh, the women really matter. Bullshit. If anybody should be introducing the NXT women, it's Triple H. End of fucking discussion. It's not always about you, you stupid bitch. And frankly, frankly... I wouldn't want Stephanie touching any of this shit from a creative standpoint anyways. If I'm watching it on TV, I'm like, oh, Stephanie's involved with it. I don't know that's going to be the <laughs> shit. Just like so many things involving the authority angle over the past year plus have been the <laughs> shit. But anyways, once you strip past the bullshit and everything else, this match was good once it got going and these ladies got plenty of time. They merited the time. They deserved the time. And they made the most of their time and hats off to them. I will say this, though. Fucking Brie Bella was annoying as shit because she's clearly not in the same class as Charlotte and Sasha Banks. So the whole time, I just wanted to basically be a one-on-one -on -one match between Charlotte and Sasha Banks. And then we're fucking throwing Brie, Brie Bella in there. She literally was like a fucking gnat that you wanted to swat away, not in a good type of heel way. It's just like, stop fucking it up. Stop getting in the fucking way. Let Charlotte and Sasha Banks show you what good women's wrestlers are. Just get out of the fucking way. I just still really don't understand the purpose of this match. It was following up on what they did on Raw, sure. But the champ wasn't involved. There was no title shot on the line. It just... They got a long way to go before you can sit there and convince me that they're going to do anything worthwhile with this Divas division. But for one night, this match was a really good showcase for Charlotte and Sasha Banks. And from an athletic standpoint, in terms of a talent standpoint in the ring, they showed you just what they've been doing down at the NXT level and just how lacking some of these Divas on the WWE main roster are. You know, we got to cut out all the bullshit here. Let's be perfectly honest. I've said it before, and I said it again. Everything involving John Cena ultimately is a waste of fucking time. If you already know how it's going to play out and how it's going to finish, why even bother? And frankly, the whole notion of anybody legitimately beating John Cena multiple times is so laughable that you might as well not even go through the, with the match. It legitimately is more believable if Cena comes down the ramp first 
And then his opponent comes down the ramp. They start talking all this shit like Kevin Owens does, talking about it's the same old shit for 10 years, blah, blah, blah. And John Cena got on the mic and said, that's right, bitch. You know what's going to happen eventually, so why not save everybody the effort and the trouble? And then that guy lays down. Cena wins one, two, three. And you saved us about 20 fucking minutes. That happening is much more believable than actually thinking foolishly, I guess, that somebody could actually beat Cena more than once in a 10-year stretch. Holy fucking shit. And what's even more aggravating about this now is the fact for a fan base that for so many years has despised so many things involving John Felix Anthony Cena to the point where he is the representation, in some ways understandably so, of everything that is wrong with the modern-day, corporatized, bullshit, vanilla-ass, conservative WWE. And now, he's become one of your fucking heroes. John Cena's become an ROH main eventer. He's become one of those indie stars who flips and kicks and no-sells and false finishes and botches moves and doesn't bother to tell a story that you love. See, umpteen dozen guys in the independent scene. See, umpteen dozen guys, oh hell, other guys in WWE and TNA and ROH. And now John Cena's become the poster child for that. What the fuck happened? And now all of a sudden, here it is, another overrated ass fucking John Cena match. Bocce in his presentation and execution. Ridiculously placed moves. A match that tells absolutely no fucking story of any kind whatsoever. And no point in time gets you to suspend anywhere close to any level of disbelief whatsoever. All of these high spots thrown together, all of these near falls and false finishes, numerous usages of finishers only to kick out of them, diminishing the move of them fucking selves, and LOL, Cena wins. Is it 2005 or 2015? We've wasted 10 years doing this song and dance, 10 years of doing the same fucking shit. You would think. The incompetent, ignorant nincompoops involved with the WWE, up to and including this fucking cancerous fuck John Cena, would understand at some point in time that you gotta build up other people. That it can't always be about this one asshat. It can't always be about this one guy. Maybe at some point in time we need to start treating Kevin Owens and everybody else like fucking Make-A-Wish kids. So that way maybe there is some certain chance that they could actually go over on John fucking Cena. Because this shit is ridiculous. Not only do you sit there and not have Cena lose, not only do you decide to beat Kevin Owens clean, you decide this time that it's such compelling storytelling that you decide to have John Cena make him fucking tap out. Why would anybody ever need to see this match ever again? Why should anybody ever believe Kevin Owens and take him seriously when he couldn't do what he said he was going to do? He goes from beating the bot guy clean, to now getting pinned by him, to now fucking getting tapped out by him. And what's even more ridiculous about this, he's getting tapped out by a maneuver that Kevin Owens himself can perform better than the guy winning with that submission finisher in John Cena. How fucking ridiculous is this shit? You idiots that sit there and overrate these fucking matches, stop it. You idiots that are sitting there and talking about how great Cena has become, stop it. Because you are a problem now. You are contributing to the delinquency of the WWE fucking E. You are contributing to the John Cena monster. You are creating an even bigger cancerous growth in John fucking Cena. Enough is enough, god damn it. It's 10 plus years later and we're still doing the same shit. The same shit. And it's not like there's a whole bunch of ratings or live event attendance or money drawing indicators that point to the fact that Cena is the right prop to have as your top guy in the fucking company anyway. Here's the chance to build up somebody legitimate like a Kevin Owens. Build him up into potentially a future opponent for Brock Lesnar. A future opponent for maybe The Undertaker at a WrestleMania. Who the fuck knows? And a legitimate one in a serious one to where you wouldn't be sure whether or not he could actually be beat. Somebody that you take seriously is do that talk shit and backs it fucking up. 
Now instead, what has Kevin Owens become? Just like most of the other punk bitch heels in the WWE. A guy that talks shit, ultimately can't back it up, and jobs out to the fucking monster. LOL, Cena wins. How stupid of me to ever fucking expect this company to do anything other than this stupid shit. And you assholes that are sitting there and defending this crap, you assholes that are sitting there and overrating these Cena fucking matches, that are sitting there trying to justify what's going on with Cena, stop it! You are part of the problem. After all these years, you've caved. He's made you tap out. Vince has made you tap out. No, fuck that shit. By this point in time, I think people were ready to sit there and just decimate this show and be done with it. But you still had the world title match. Brock Lesnar versus Seth Rollins. And this has been something that people have been looking forward to for a while. This has been something that's been set in motion since WrestleMania 31. So we've got that moment. It is here. They decided to bring Brock Lesnar back now instead of waiting until SummerSlam to do this match. So many of you were hoping maybe that there was going to be an interesting battle here, a real contrast in styles and everything else. And you were disappointed. Kind of bothers me when I see Cena back at SummerSlam last year selling Lesnar suplexes like they're the biggest, most dangerous thing in the freaking world and the most horrible thing in the world. Yet when Rollins gets them, he kind of like almost haphazardly kind of just shrugs them off like they're not that big of a deal. I don't know, that kind of bothers me. It also kind of bothers me too. While Lesnar brings a bit of an it factor with him, and he most certainly is needed in the WWE at this point in time, it does not eliminate the fact that for all the shit you'll talk about, let's say, a Cena for many years about his five moves to doom, or Randy Orton and his five moves to doom, or Roman Reigns and his three and a half moves of Kevin Nash diesel type of doom, is that Brock Lesnar basically has three moves. It is a suplex. A stomp around in an F5, and that's fucking in. I don't understand why people think so many of his matches are so freaking awesome. Yes, they have a different feel to him, but at some point in time, it does get repetitive. They are the same basic fucking match every single time. I just say. But I guess if you were hoping for some great classic here, you were going to be disappointed. But maybe you shouldn't be. Because as I talked about in the Battleground preview, I really didn't see where they had any finish for this match. You couldn't really have Brock Lesnar win. You couldn't really have Seth Rollins win. You really couldn't have Seth Rollins win via DQ or countout. You couldn't really have Sheamus cash in. I mean, what option did you have? So you really didn't have a finish for this show in this match. And you really didn't have a clear-cut main event in mind for SummerSlam. So the WWE does what the WWE so often has to do because they created this situation because they have no other choice. And they say, back to the 90s! And here comes The Undertaker. <sighs> oh, man. Now, don't get me wrong. When a taker shows up, it's a big fucking deal. Whether I really want to see him wrestle or not, it's a big fucking deal. This is still the man I respect more than anybody in the history of professional wrestling. It's a big fucking deal. There will always be that little kid in me, no matter what, no matter how I feel about anything, that's going to geek out and mark the fuck out when I see The Undertaker because, by God, this is The Fucking Undertaker. When you want to talk about larger than life, when you want to talk about real superstar, household name, all that other shit, it's The Undertaker. And here you are, Battleground. You don't really have a clear-cut finish for the fucking title match? Then this is what you do. Because it, in a way, makes a lot of sense. Lesnar took from Taker what he valued most. Now Taker's going to fuck with him and take from Lesnar what he valued most. That opportunity at that world championship. Now some of you, sure, will sit there and say, why the fuck did he wait almost a year and a half in order to come back at Lesnar? It's a fair question. We'll see what answers we get to that. Some of you may say, well, it's because of what he did to Kane and that's why he's coming back. I say that may be layered in there at some point in time, but that's not going to be the selling point of this. Stop being fucking stupid, because we ultimately know that they've been talking about Lesnar breaking the streak for over a fucking year. They keep mentioning it all the fucking time, and that's why Taker came back to go after Lesnar and cost him the fucking title match. Because why, why all of a sudden would he fucking give a shit about Kane? And furthermore, if he gave that much of a shit about Kane, why the hell wouldn't he try and take out Seth Rollins? Why wouldn't he fucking go attack Seth Rollins? 
You get what I'm saying here? But the whole thing is, is you again, you're pushing aside the guy that's the full-timer, that's there all the time in Rollins, for the guy that's there part of the time, four or five matches a year, if that, for the guy who's there for one, or in this case, two matches a year in The Undertaker. It's about that identity crisis. It's supposed to be a transitional period of X number of years. It's supposed to be building for the future. Yet every chance that WWE gets, they get into kind of that panic mode, and they have to sit there and go back to the future, and go back to the 90s, and back to the Attitude Era, and bring in this guy, and bring in that guy, because they can't fucking make new stars. Well, no shit, dumb shits. When you sit there and do the shit you do with Cena, well, ding dong, dumb dick, what other choice do you have but to bring back these fossils from the past? And I love Taker to death, respect him more than anybody else in the history of the business. This is a man that's been around for freaking ever. He's close to 50 years old if he's not already 50 years old. I mean, he's not that same guy. While it's cool to see him, and the thought of him wrestling at a SummerSlam in a way is pretty cool, at the end of the day, I want to move on myself at some point in time. Can't can he make interesting things happen out of the roster that they're full time today? But you know, and the, the thing is here with Lesnar and Taker, at least if anything else, it is the SummerSlam main event that the WWE needed because God knows they didn't have one on the active roster. It wasn't there. This was the only real viable option that they had. It was the one that made the most sense. It's the one that's going to work. It's the one that has the most interest to it. They had to do it. They had to do it. Because they put themselves in this position and situation where, frankly, they really had no other choice. If you are going to do a non-finish to a title match in the main event of your pay-per-view, this is the type of non-finish that you do. However, with that said, it doesn't change the fact that this match, I don't even think, went 10 minutes. And even with Taker taking forever to get down and fucking do all of this shit and all of this and all of that, you still have like 15 plus minutes left on the fucking show. You have your own network and you still can't manage to actually give people three freaking hours. Why the hell did you only have six matches on this card if you were still going to have 15 plus minutes of free time at the fucking end? It means you managed your time terribly. It means you don't know what the fuck you were doing. You can't sit there and plan and produce a freaking show and make sure that you film at least most of the damn time. Leaving almost 20 minutes on the clock is inexcusable and unacceptable. That was your main event. At least, like I said, if you are going to do that type of finish with the main event, that's the type of non-finish finish that you fucking do. It's creative. It catches people by surprise. It gets you hooked to see what's going to happen next. It builds to the next pay-per-view. And ultimately, that's the real skill of the WWE. The skill is not in their greatness. It's not in their writing, certainly. It's most certainly not in their booking. Their skill is they can sit there and tread water, do a lot of mediocre crap, waste your time with a lot of other stuff, and then get you at the end with that one fucking thing. They give you just enough to hook you in and sucker you in, and keep you coming back for more. And that's what this is here. The fact that Undertaker comes back most certainly doesn't gloss over the fact that this was a crappy show. Not only did Owens lose, but he fucking taps out to Cena. Who the hell is ever going to beat Cena for that U.S. title? Randy Orton versus Sheamus was a thing, a match, and it happened. you got Bray Wyatt wrestling boring matches in a way that in no way, shape, or form matches the character that he's supposed to fucking be. You had a Divas match that was thrown on the card at the last minute, and while good, really didn't serve a whole lot of other fucking purpose. It almost felt like it should have been one of the one-hour or two-hour main events on a freaking Raw. And then after months of building to Rollins versus Lesnar at a big pay-per-view like this moment, we decide to go less than 10 minutes and make the focus about shit that happened at WrestleMania 31. So basically now we're taking the top babyface in Brock Lesnar, mind you, we're taking the top babyface in Brock Lesnar, and now after getting you to like him, after getting you to want to see him and want to root and cheer for him, we're going to keep reminding you again why you fucking should hate him because, oh, hey, ding dong, dumb dicks, he's the one in the 21-1. and one. He's the one that beat The Undertaker. And you're most certainly not going to cheer for Brock Lesnar over The Fucking Undertaker because he's The Fucking Undertaker. 
And you can even see in the way he carries himself in what he did on Battleground. I mean, I like Don't Gives a Fuck Taker. And that was Don't Gives a Fuck Taker. And what I really like is the fact that this guy's badass enough. Most people in that situation, when the crowd's chanting one more time, one more time after two tombstones, hey, they would have sat there and done a third one. Not Taker. He said, fuck you. I work you. You don't work me. I'm Undertaker. Ha ha, motherfucker. And I'm going to sit there and go down and go, because I'm a badass, because that's what I do. But Jesus Christ. Again, it speaks to the whole identity crisis of the WWE that I'll be talking about this week. You want to build for the future, but you always go back to the past. We sit there and do this and do that and all this other crap. And at the end of the day, the whole purpose, the whole rationale and reasoning that you were sold about Lester ending the streak at WrestleMania was to get a return on the investment to help the company out long term which really all it was was a knee-jerk reflex thing that Vince had in mind to really try to launch the network off big. Don't ever fucking think it was anything other than that. How ridiculous would it be for Lesnar to end the streak just for Taker to be the one to come back and beat him? While it makes sense from a storyline standpoint in a way and from a revenge standpoint in a way, why the fuck would you do that? And furthermore, Taker deserves to get that revenge. So again, you're creating a similar situation as you would involving a match with Sting versus Bray Wyatt and Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker. You have a guy in Brock Lesnar that can't lose and shouldn't lose versus Taker in the situation that he's in. Frankly, he can't lose and shouldn't lose. And that doesn't make for compelling television. That doesn't necessarily make for a compelling pay-per-view match. That leaves you torn and not in a good way to where no matter what, you're not going to be fucking happy. And I guess that's appropriate in today's WWE. Most of the shit they do leaves me unsatisfied and ultimately unhappy. Now I will take the Schleg Daddy pen out of the ear and I will close out by saying this. Nerd hat off. Annoying ass, cynical, jaded WWE dipshit hat off. Undertaker. It's time. Get revenge on this sandwich salesman, North Dakota, Minnesota, stupid back tattoo, having block-headed motherfucker. You tell him to take his buzz cut and his nasty wife and stick it where the sun don't fucking shine. You tombstone him left, you tombstone him right, you tombstone him straight to hell at SummerSlam that Sunday night. Fucking beat that motherfucker's ass. You stiff him. You say, fuck you. You say, fuck you, Vince. I get my revenge because I'm the Undertaker, motherfucker. Yeah.